Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Citizens of Craft podcast. As we get closer and closer to the next national celebration of craft, the Canadian Crafts Federation's Craft Year 2020, it is really important that we recognize the key role that educational and residency programs bring to the national craft community. These are some of the most important places that artists can take dedicated time to focus on themselves, their skills, their interests, and take some crucial time to do important research and reflection. Schools and residencies are some of the key places where this magic happens, and it can really change the life of an artist and the direction of an arts career. For today's episode, we're focusing on that direction and the many pathways that craft artists take in order to reach their goals. We are lucky to have two extremely talented, dedicated, and highly respected women in the Canadian craft sector on the line with us today, including jeweler, metal artist, and long-term faculty member at the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design, Brigitte Clavet, as well as writer, dedicated craft collector, and cultural administrator, the director of craft and design at Harborfront Centre, Melanie Egan. These two guests bring their extensive experience to this discussion, particularly their experience with the organizations that they work within, both for over 30 years each. These two institutions are true crucibles of craft practice, where artists of all stripes have come to hone their skills and forge a path forward. At first glance, these institutions differ greatly. On one hand, the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design is a community college-based educational institution based in Fredericton, New Brunswick, while Harborfront Center's craft residency program is housed within a multidisciplinary public arts and culture center in downtown Toronto. But both take different approaches toward the same end, to instill a strong entrepreneurial spirit within their residents and students alike to help them grow. So join us as we jump right into the conversation around this week's manifesto statement, Cookie Cutter Doesn't Cut It. You appreciate that craft brings different cultures and perspectives into your space. We start with Melanie Egan of Harborfront Center, discussing how they approach the big question of how do you support craft from your facility? When people say craft, I've always asked them, I, I say like, which one are you talking about? Mm-hmm. Um, there's so much and within each one of the different genres. That's why I sort of see it as a very heterogeneous kind of community. Um, that textile people are different from jewelers or different from glass people or different from furniture makers or different from ceramic people. Um, so I try to be responsive to the particular needs within sort of that individual uh, sort of stream, whether it's ceramics or jewelry, but then also to be responsive to those larger issues within uh, um, and concerns and needs uh, within craft and design. And over the years, because we live in Toronto, where it's in a very expensive city to, to be, um, mm-hmm. the ability to live and to work and to create that balance has been shifting over the last number of years. And I understand in in schools as well um, from students, um, the pressures of just, you know, paying rent and, you know, being out on your own and that kind of thing. So again, to try to be responsive and to, to acknowledge that the rhythm of making might be a little bit different than it was say even 30 years ago. Um, And that the residency still has to serve these young artists where they are and not to sort of repeat the same kind of formula over and over again. So nimble. I think that we have to be very nimble um, with regard to um, students and postgraduates as well. Mm -hmm. I agree. That's why we want everybody to move to New Brunswick. Right? <laughs> lifestyle is much more affordable. Uh, yeah. The tuition is, yes. is low, and the uh, the contact hours with the teacher is pretty well, uh, very good ratio. I mean, <laughs> so that's my pitch for the, the well, <laughs> gosh, uh, come to New Brunswick. Yeah, you can well, get a studio. Brigitte, when I was there visiting um, a little over yes. a year ago. I was so mm-hmm. impressed by the school. I have to tell you, impressed by you, but I've always been impressed yeah. by you. Um, Thank and you. And <laughs> just like the quality of making, the dedication and the commitment mm-hmm. to making um, yes. yeah. was was very impressive. And Thank you. Uh, I think that's how I congratulate you. Place you, is small. Know, you know, I congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The school will be proud to hear this because I think that's our 
we, we really focus and cherish the fact that we can spend so much time with our students. The classes are small. We only have 300 students in the whole school with eight studios. So when you do the math, it's pretty good. A class of 10, 12. I mean, in the media, it's like, for example, photography and digital media, they have larger classes. They work with laptops and different equipment. But in the, in the crafts, I call them the dirty crafts, the ones where you get your hands filled with dye upstairs in the textiles or ceramics or jewelry, uh, 10 students is optimal. Mm -hmm for teaching and then you can graduate eight to ten you're doing very well and those students have our focus and our attention we can't hide behind anything because we don't have a class of 200 so this is really it's it's real uh work in the trenches for education i think especially for craft education yeah i agree with you and i think that's also one of the nice things about the artist in residency program at harborfront because we have maximum 26 people and uh -huh. over a three-year period. And we can really dedicate ourselves to these artists mm -hmm. and their careers and give them all the resources and help and support that they actually need to sort of bridge into a uh, professional um, career. And I think that that ratio is extremely important um, so that, as you say, you're not hiding behind. You can't hide. <laughs> no, no, you can't. Yeah, It's actually supporting people for their successes as well. You know, it's not just saying, okay, now you're done, get out of here. We're, do we're doing a lot of that right now at the college, more in the past year in particular, uh, supporting students uh, after graduation. In the summertime, we are hiring this summer 32 students to work out in the casemates, I have set up small studios. They're getting uh, wages uh, to, they're basically our, their emissaries or our advocates for the college. Yep. It's the best, and it's so wonderful. It's experiential learning. They've got to be able to, speak with the public deal with the public deal with their own work write reports do all the stuff that is about that come back next year for another year and then have that much more um many more tools in the toolkit and so with the asp program too, the advanced studio practice that's the same thing we're just doing so well there with the students giving them all that real life experience um, to get them ready. Because I'll tell you, when I graduated from NASCAD in 1980, I didn't have a CV. We didn't talk about those yeah. things in those days. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're not there. We're, we're, we're beyond that. And I think that goes for the residency program at Harborfront too. You get that real life experience. You get that, you know, boots on the ground in the studio and engaging with the public. Um, this whole conversation really fits into the reason why we wanted to have this conversation around the Citizens of Craft manifesto of cookie cutter doesn't cut it. Because mm -hmm. it, it feels like such a good theme to talk about residencies in education um, and also about personal experiences in the craft sector because it alludes to that fact that there is no one sort of all-knowing right way to approach craft, but there's certainly some steps that that guide you along the way and some experiences that help you figure out what your path is going to be. Um, so I just want to step right back to that cookie cutter doesn't cut it language. <laughs> what were your initial thoughts when you when you heard that manifesto statement? Did it ring true with you for a craft experience? Um, mm -hmm. How did it resonate with you? We'll go with Brigitte first. Um, it did right away because of how we are teaching here or how I see my students, uh, the, the face of the student. I have some young, I have some uh, of all genders, I have uh, some of all ages, and I have some who are wanting to do production work. I have want to do more one-of-a-kind work and I have to find a way to reach every one of them and to help them reach their potentials whether they're just doing a small inquiry right now through this project into I don't know uh, some concept that they stumbled upon or because they want to do something repetitively until they've actually mastered that that hand-eye wonderful thing that we do as makers so um, when I saw the cookie cutter thing I said yeah exactly as long as I've taught here, I don't think I've ever produced two people exactly the same, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's a beginning for me. And Melanie, what are your thoughts? I just finished the year-end performance evaluations uh, for all the artists in residence. And I've been asked in the past, you know, what is the goal of the Craft and Design Studio at Harbor Friends Center? And I said, well, you should say goals. If there's 25 to 26 people, there's 25 to 26 different goals mm, very true. and the year-end evaluations are done with uh, two um, outside advisors as well and so we meet with them we talk about what, what it is they want to do where they want to go talk about their work specifically um, and then we support them 
and give them the resources that they need to achieve their particular goals. And the goals in the textile studio are not the same as the goals in the ceramic studio. It's it's a very mm-hmm. different kind of thing. So the expertise we have is 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 people who are you know in the field or teaching to help uh, to help uh, the artists out. And because we have this evaluation system, um, it really then pushes the the artists to achieve their particular goals, and they also feel that they are achievable. Because it's like those mm-hmm. of those who've gone before you, um, whether it's being you know, grant information or, or saying, you know, you should be reading this book and looking at this artist's work and that kind of thing. They feel emboldened and supported within their field. They don't feel isolated. Um, but then there's those other larger sort of singular goals of, of the particular residency, which is to have everybody who leaves there um be embarked on a sustainable career, whatever that career may be, or they might be going back for their master's. So that's our, our responsibility to, to have them leave with this confidence within their career yeah. mm-hmm. um, that they've had exhibitions. They know how to approach a curator. They know how to write a grant. Um, they have a decent looking CV. Um, they know w- what all the, the, like the vendors and resources for uh, you know, supplies and tools and like all that really basic thing. And then of course in the glass studio, because we don't have any technicians at Harborfront center because it is a training facility as well as an incubator. Mm -hmm. Um, They know how to build a glass furnace by the time they leave. And that's really, really important because you can't order up a glass furnace. in Mm -hmm. a catalog. That's huge. Um, Mm -hmm. So these really sort of practical goals that we have um, for them when they leave. But as you say, they're not all the same for all the people. Oh, and the second point was really hysterically funny because there is a, a, a jeweler named Andre Veshman who made cookie cutter rings. Oh, nice. <laughs> Individual, one of a kind cookie cutter rings. And you actually could cut cookies with them. So it's, those were two things that popped into my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to get my hands on one of those rings. So that, uh, that'll be the one time when cookie cutter would cut it, mm-hmm. I suppose. I wanted to add to that that the uh, 32... Uh, residencies that our students have um, competed for for this summer. I don't know, I forget how many people applied, but there are 30, and we, those are first year and second year students. And they had to, and also the ASP, the ones who are finishing, but they had to make a proposal and they had to say, I want to work there because of this, and this is what I want to do. And uh, they will get some materials from the various studios to help set up that little space, but really they're on their own. And it had to make sense. It had, they have to be in good academic standing because that's important as well but they had to be able to uh, write and formalize what it is that they were going to do for those eight to ten paid weeks free like free from teachers free from technicians and so uh, it was really interesting to see who applied and how they applied and who made it and some of them I mean it'd be great if we could have given more but that's a very good start for our first summer Uh, we did some last summer as well less formally and this year this is a hot ticket in town I'll tell you with these students and I think it's going to really raise the bar for next year for academic and for uh, performance and also for Good work because it's going to get more and more competitive. Mm, I love to see those structures coming up, and that that you know, and Melanie hit it on the head earlier with the idea that an incubator is such an important part of this program. It's not about just telling people how to do what they've got to do, you know, holding their hand the whole time and then mm-hmm. sending them on their way with a boot out the door. It's you know, how do you actually empower people to start to take on this role? for themselves um, and also to understand how they can connect with a community beyond the schools or beyond, you know, the residency program, because you really are on your own, but there are communities out there that you can reach out to, that you can connect with. And there's kind of one thing, one more thing about the, that life of the artist idea and, and talking about the journeys of how to get there and the experiences of how to get there. I think that in the general public, there's a lot of misconceptions about what that journey looks like. And of course, not everyone is going to know all the ins and outs of, of how to go through every career or how to develop every different kind of career. But I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what it takes to be in craft and what that craft career choice really entails. So I know that both of you have a lot of different experiences um, across the board and all the different artistic and, and administrative style work that you do. But I'm curious if you'd be willing to kind of name 
some of the different ways um, that you work in the arts. There's so many different angles to being an artist. There's 101 different ways to be an artist and 101 different ways to become an artist. But what are some of those 101 ways that you approach <laughs> being an artist? Um, maybe we'll start with go. Melanie. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. Um, well, I'm not an artist. Uh, mm-hmm. for, um, I guess I'm a cultural administrator. Maybe is the is the best sort of broadish term. But apart, I mean, a, um, in addition to um, heading up the artist in residency program, I also curate exhibitions. So I have certain ideas that all come under the umbrella of making and thinking, and like to present work that I think is relevant that the public should see because we, we are a public institution, HarperCollins Center is a public institution, uh, free galleries, et cetera. And they come and watch um, artists and residents working, that kind of thing. Um, I write, uh, I've written uh, a number of catalog forwards and I lecture uh, about craft. Um, mentoring is extremely important to me. Um, I mentor even after the artists and residents leave uh, Harbor Front Center because I think that that's an important way to sort of serve the community. I, you know, I sit and I volunteer all over the place <laughs> <laughs> on the program arts committees for like the Ontario College of Art and Design University and Sheridan College and George Brown College. So I give um, my support suggestions and advice in that capacity. Um, and I do special programs, symposium and conferences and inviting people to come and speak about all sorts of things, whether it's... Um, Things in general, like Collaboration 2.0 was a recent symposium um, that uh, we had back in November, uh, talking about the role of collaboration, um, which has been around for a number of years, and sort of where where are we now? How is it manifested in, in um, artists and designers and, and, and craftspeople's lives? And one of the other great and joyful things I get to do is I am a consumer. Um, mm. <laughs> and... I think it's very important to, I value this work. So I buy this work. This work is in my life. I use this work. I wear this work. I never go out the door without a brooch on. Thank you, Paul McClure, who chastised <laughs> me years ago, who said that I didn't you know, wear enough jewelry um, and took that to heart. And so every day I get to choose what brooch to wear. Sometimes I choose the brooch before I choose my outfit. So these are sort of all the other ways um, that I think that I can that I can support the greater craft and design community. And one of the other ways is the people that I talk to, the people close to me, whether that's family or friends, I urge them and encourage them also to embrace craft in their life. Consequently, I have a daughter who buys craft, who supports craft, knows a lot of craft people, and she's the next generation. So I think that's an important thing. An important role that I play as well is to support young people to support craft and design. Yeah, and I think you really nailed it with that one saying, you know, we really have to, we A, we have to preach craft and B, we have to practice what we preach and we have to teach other people how to be a part of that community or op- maybe not teach them necessarily how to do it, but open the door so that they can walk through that gallery or walk through that boutique or walk through that studio. and have a personal connection with the objects. And I really feel like that's the most fun part about being in the craft world is that you get to engage with all these pieces and engage with all these people. And who doesn't want to go to that craft party, right? I mean, wear it on your on your lapel, rock it in your hair, you know, drink out of it from every party, every cup, and just experience life in that way. Good job. Brigitte, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I know you come at it from from a multitude of perspectives. Not only are you a teacher and and also working within institutions and assisting with uh, programming, and then you're also an artist yourself with a, a really really impressive mm-hmm. career. And I'm so proud of the work that you've been producing lately. It's it's just so engaging. And Thank you. Thank so you. tell us a little bit about well, that experience for you balancing those things. Well, it's an interesting thing. Uh, there are certain parts of your life where you have to do certain things. And whether it's because you've got a companion that you live with, or you're having children, or you're doing education, or you're, uh, like I used to run a little shop in St. Andrews, and I had a bed and breakfast. And so focus becomes a little 
you have your finger in many things. Right, right now I'm at an age and I'm also nearing retirement and I am thinking in, about things in a different way. And I also made space uh, in my mind two years ago when I let go of being the studio head after 30 years to give an opportunity to a wonderful young woman, Kristen Cooper, to um, learn and be in charge and what that did and it, I'm, I'm feeling also that the, the college is very respectful for me I haven't been felt like I've been be, to be put out to pasture <laughs> so um <laughs> but what that did it was a conscious decision on my part I needed to make a change in my life and I thought what was the most um the thing that takes most of my day is my my daughter's grown she's gone um and she's successful and I thought change what I, who I am or my label I suppose and that created a lot of space in my mind which funny enough gave me a lot of time in my studio I still spend the same amount of time here at college but something literally shifted so what happens to me I find that I have I support other artists and I think it, the support of each other is critically important I'm also a big advocate for membership membership in organizations in guilds in galleries mm -hmm. uh, I'm a member of everything I'm also a board member often you I think our contributions uh, as emerging artists uh, senior artists it doesn't matter which time of your career there are times for certain voices to be heard and uh there are opportunities where people need some work done and don't i i urge people to never shy away from that i also volunteer a lot if there's a show to be hung up or there's so i used to pick up uh, whatever bottles with my daughter for her ski team or whatever there's always some volunteering that's important and i think that's um as a human being it's one of the simpler things that we can do I also, uh, I jury often. I'm invited either by Canada Council, let's say, or Arts and B, or various organizations. And I think that is also very important to, um, I, it, gets, it allows me to see what's going on elsewhere. And it also allows uh, my voice and the metal voice and the New Brunswick voice to be heard at different levels as well. Um, I curate exhibitions. I've been doing that for a number of years, usually quite anonymously, but now not so much. I'm starting to make more of a stamp on that. I've done a number of craft shows in my life. I can do one with little $10 items or I can do... Um, one of a kind exhibitions like I've just done this year. I'm working on a solo show uh, for St. John. And I also uh, just finished a really successful show in Burlington with uh, Lou Lin and Chantal Gilbert. So these things are at one point in your career, you start to associate and affiliate yourself with people and people invite you, recognize the potential in certain groups or certain media. And then all of a sudden you're building on these things. What else do I do? Um, what else do I do? And I do education for sure, workshops, residencies. I mentor others. I'm never uh, short for words to help and look at something, no matter how simple or complex the piece is. I try to be respectful, but there are times for everything. And residencies, I've just lately done them in my uh, maybe the past 10 years or so. And the moment of reflection that happens there is beyond description because I don't usually enter these residencies uh, in the metal. I, uh, I do a residency where I'm just free to think and manipulate other uh, materials. And that frees me, makes me a better metalsmith. I don't know how that works, but last spring I worked in Kamuraska for collaborate, um, 20, uh, Collaboration 18. And it's based on the MLA concept uh, where a number of artists came together. So I just burnt wood and made such incredible work. And that really informed where I uh, went this year. So anyway, it's long winded, but that's uh, what I do. Well, that's the 101 different ways to approach things, right? I mean, it all it all feels long winded when you put it in a big, long sentence. But when you spread it out yes. over the lifetime of a career, each of those steps has been integral into moving into the next yes. thing, or you know, even if it's not uh, sort of a one, two, three moving forward, it's a beautiful dance of craft development that all kind of culminates in a big yeah. performance. Well said. Mm -hmm. So you know, when you're talking about that, we talk about that dance, that dance of craft being a, 
um, the culmination of a career and and building up to those moments of beauty and and it is a beautiful thing. Um, I I you mentioned you both mentioned mentorship and the importance of mentorship, and I really think it's interesting to think about how in the past, like looking back into the history of craft a lot of the development and the skill and the training happened through apprenticeships, but that's far less of an activity or formalized activity. The, you know, apprenticeship system is no longer what it used to be, but we do have education, residency programs, mentorships, you know, one-on-one -on -one with artists and with curators and, and with um, people who are developing skills. So, you know, things have really changed, but that, that um, importance of mentorship remains. So, because residencies and schools have kind of grown from that history of sharing and and of training, how do you think that has changed um, the way that we all kind of communicate and, and work together in craft today? Um, how do you think that residency uh, artists or students kind of use that experience of of mentorship and apprenticeship to figure out how they want to be artists and what they want to do next? What I was saying is that I find that um, you need to have a, a, a student or a person who is engaged into their self-discovery needs a lot of self um determination, I suppose, and self-direction. And not everybody's always ready for that. So I have a, occasionally a student who will just plow through anything that they, he or she is given and they will, you know, make their way through that. But sometimes there's other people who need a little bit more nurturing. And sometimes we have to tell them that they actually, what I see is not what they see. And that's an interesting dialogue. It doesn't become any more about, well, you, you didn't do a very good ring there or you're not, uh, whatever. Uh, it, it's about the, the belief and having, it's, I think, a lot of humility too. I don't know how it all works together, but it's more of a feeling that I'm, I, I can help somebody but they have to be ready to be helped and they have to be on that trajectory. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they step aside of the trajectory and that's okay. And they need more uh, directives and more, but the, 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 the person has to have a lot of um, self-direction and motivation and desire. So unless those things are all in place, uh, you can't always help. You can continue mentoring. But for me, the rich stuff happens when that person is engaged on all, you know, all, all cylinders. Mm -hmm. Emily, your thoughts there? Yeah, it's interesting that one of our, one of the criteria uh, for the, to apply is you have to, uh, it's called self-motivation. And everybody in the interviews, and oh yes, yes, totally self-motivated. But it's one of the hardest things to do because it means that you've left school where in this very tight community, they become your friends, they become your colleagues, your peers. And then you go into this other situation where not everybody knows everybody else. There aren't any deadlines. Mm -hmm. There aren't professors telling you when you need to get projects done on time. So the some of the support goes away. And that's one of the good things about the residency program. It's kind of this bridging support. Mm -hmm. So that first six months is extremely difficult for them. They don't know what to do. Um, they get discouraged. And it's like, okay, this is when you have to start to reach out. You have to seek mm -hmm. out member mentorship as well as have mentorship given to you. And it's a really interesting um, experience watching that confidence grow because what happens is that they come to me or they come to the coordinator of craft and design, Robin Wilcox, who's a fantastic woman, totally dedicated as well to uh, the field. Um, but they also go to their fellow artists and residents. So they build a peer to peer mentoring group. So it happens in these really lovely and organic kind of ways. Like mentorship isn't sort of foisted upon you. I don't foist my mentorship up to people. <laughs> um, I am there. I'm a resource. The reason I'm, you know, I work at Harbor Front Center is to support the people in the studio. So it's this really um, sort of two way kind of relationship because they have to learn that they have to have the confidence to reach out to people. Because I can suggest and say, well, you know, you should go and talk to so-and-so because they work in a similar way in your practice. And they go, oh, I said, look, I will broker that conversation. I will call them. I will talk to them. I will introduce you, you know, through email. You know, I can make this happen for you. And then by the end of the three years, they're doing it themselves. 
Because mm-hmm. part of their contractual um, obligations is they have to reach out to their to their external advisors without me, without the administrations. Like you have to do this because it's something that you need to learn in order to sustain the craft and design community at large. Again, it's the peer to peer and you know the, the reaching out to the experts, and it's a learned process. And some some just latch right onto it. Some need just a little encouragement. Some need to be shoved towards it, to be quite honest. Um, <laughs> because one of the things, and I think Brigitte might agree with me here, there's a lot of introverts within this particular craft and design community and artistic community. Um, and that yeah. needs to be treated carefully, but also firmly with a structure to move them forward. That there's people out there who can help you. There's people out there who want to help um, so, but I think that's that again touches on that craft empowerment and how education and residency programs and even your own self guided motivation that that self drive that we've been talking about that is such an important um, symbolic and tactile um, example of craft empowerment. You've been listening to the Citizens of Craft podcast, produced by the Canadian Crafts Federation. Now it's time for our special segment, The Topic at Hand. For this episode, I'm proud to bring you the Canadian Crafts Federation's digital content developer, Vina Carr. Hi, I'm Vina Carr, digital content developer at the Canadian Crafts Federation and graphic design alum of the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design. As craft is a visual art, we often focus on the finished product, what we see in the gallery or shop. But there is so much going on behind the scenes to make the finished product a reality. How do we share the artist's experience of creating that object? Craft is a medium that engages all the senses. The feel of the tools, the smell of the materials, and the sounds of the studio. Join me on an auditory tour of the various studios here at the college. When we think of design, we tend to think of the typical familiar noises. But I want to show you the sounds of the craft world, which may be less familiar. In the ceramic studio, you can hear potters slapping and shaping clay, pottery wheels spinning, the kiln firing, and sometimes, oops, onto the textile studio. Here you will hear knitting machines, wet felting, and looms weaving. Let's head to the metal art studio. The artists here work with fire. and hammers. The metal studio can also be a quieter, intimate place where metal is shaped with saws and files. And to get that shiny finish, a good buff on the polishing wheel. On to the Aboriginal Visual Arts Studio. This studio covers a wide variety of mediums, including but not limited to woodworking, basket making, quill work and beading, and drum making. We at the Canadian Crafts Federation encourage you to open the door to more studios, attend an open house, take a workshop or a class, and get familiar with the sounds of the studio in your area. The more people understand what it takes to make, the better they will understand and appreciate craft and places like the College of Craft and Design. Thank you for joining me on this auditory journey through craft at NBCCD. If you want to see inside the studios we visited today, Learn more about the college and its programs at mbccd.ca.
And now back to our main interview with the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design's Brigitte Clavette and Harborfront Center's Melanie Egan. So what breakthroughs have you seen in, I want to say in your, your students or your residents, but also in yourself through craft as, you know, a pathway for A, doing what you want to do with your life and B, being able to do that and C, kind of being proud of it and, and you know, being a part of this big community. So how have you seen people change through this force of craft empowerment? And we'll go to Brigitte first. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is myself and how my work has changed in the last couple of years. And uh, that, that concept that I said about making a bit of space at work, it's as if I, sh- I made a shift that I became parallel to myself, still going in the same direction. But essentially, I gave myself permission to change and to trust that the work that I was doing was uh, it's authentic for me and that it's not on anybody else's expectations. So that was really difficult. And I can't believe that at 62 years old, that's actually something I had to figure out because I've always thought, oh, I can do whatever I want. Nobody's going to bother me. But there's always that little voice for me that was saying, like, is that good enough? And does it fit into the context of la, la, la? And, but you know, and uh, making, and also when, when teaching or when, the greatest part of my career has been given to others when I wanted to take something for myself. Sometimes it felt a little difficult. So I think that's basically it for me is giving myself permission to create the work that I so many years of a high focus on mastering certain techniques and giving myself permission to deconstruct that and to do whatever I want. And I'm thinking that my work is probably better than it's ever been because of that. Although occasionally I'll say, okay, uh, that little teapot in the room, that's really high polished, but nobody wants to see that. Not today, I don't think. And I'm thinking, why am I doing stuff that's all banged up? And why am I leaving my cast sprues onto my pieces? It's because it's part of that, what I'm trying to say at the moment and my intuition and my working with um, impulse so those were all, believe it or not, it took me all this And time if, uh, for our listeners out there, if you have not yet seen Brigitte Clavette's work, you need to do yourself a favor and do a little Google and take a here, look at what she's here. producing now. It is amazing, truly amazing work. Um, Melanie, <laughs> can you speak a little bit about those breakthroughs, either people from the community that you've seen change happen or within yourself as well? It, it happens almost on a daily basis for me. Um, I think to be in the presence of an emerging artist's career is is an absolute privilege for me. Um, I work someplace where my personal values and my professional values line up. So I'm really grateful to be able to be in that kind of unique position. Um, mm-hmm. And I had mentioned earlier with regard to like the changing rhythm of the way young artists work due to other kinds of pressures that are in their lives. Again, because I live in the city of Toronto, that might be unique. It's probably different in other places. Um, But recently, um, she's just about getting ready to leave the studio. We'll be very sad to see her go. Her name is Habiba El Sayed, and she does performance and craft. And that was a learning curve for me, to be quite honest, because, I mean, I come from the making, the objects, the thing, you know, this kind of three-dimensional experience of, of the object. And her performance work is so incredibly relevant and moving. It's all about um, being a, a young Muslim woman in, in Canada and using craft, using materials to tell this story in incredibly powerful and important ways. Um, has been a real privilege to behold, to be quite honest. Um, so to see these different kinds of approaches to making and using the language of craft, the technique of craft, the methodology of craft, but that, that it's that thinking, um, that they make these personal breakthroughs themselves and also breakthroughs in their work. Um, she recently, uh, performed a piece at, uh, Ensika. In, oh, in the United States. So it's just really great to see that there's a platform, there's a place for this kind of work. 
as well as a place for a beautiful pair of production earrings. To me, they both exist in the same realm um, of being appreciated and valued by me and hopefully by others. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's kind of the most recent, uh, uh, I guess, breakthrough. It's just, it's, it just seems like an absolute privilege to be able to um, be in the same uh, place with this, this work being created, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It can be such a beautiful moving experience to see someone else blossom into their own. Yeah, that's kind of what I I really like about my job. I mean, um, I'm going to be turning 60 in literally a week and a half. And uh, the young people coming into the studio are either in their mm-hmm. early 20s, although we do get mature uh, people in the studio as well, which is really great. And so I, I have to have um, a responsive attitude to their needs, as I said earlier, and um, to understand where they're coming from and be able to provide a space and support for the kind of work they want to make. You know, the 26 different people and the 26 different goals and their 26 different approaches. Um, I have to be on top of that all the time and to genuinely value that different ways of doing things are extremely um, important um, for this field to grow. So true. I, f- I see that too in education. And I think uh, as I'm aging with that, <laughs> thank goodness comes a lot of wisdom and experience, but um, uh, adjusting to the new cohorts every year and where they come from, the millennials and whatever, they are a um, different way of working for sure, different approach to their education. Uh, certainly, uh, I see a, ch- a shift in um, how they want to master their work the kind of patience or focus is a little bit different. So I have to adjust to that. And I remember, it seems sometimes I think to myself, didn't I do this project before? And it was like X amount of hours. And how come we're doing that so fast now? Or how come it's taking so long? And I try to, at the end of each of the year, I always break down all the courses and everything I've taught in my projects and try to analyze how come the, the, the results were different. And sometimes it's quite obvious and sometimes it's not. But that part of me, you brought that up in a way because they're young. They keep coming in young <laughs> <laughs> and I'm getting older. And uh, that has uh, that has its fabulous um, opportunities for everybody, but it's mm-hmm. also is a challenge. So it's that constant times. evolution of of programming and of conversations and of learning how to work with each other and sharing those moments. In that idea of evolution, what what do you what would you like to see as the next evolution of craft training, whether it comes from education or residencies? What do you think? should happen is on the precipice of happening or could happen in the future that you think would be an improvement. Melanie, what do you think of that? Gosh, an improvement. I mean, we're sort of been rapidly changing over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, obviously like within schools and people's practice of, you know, the digital technologies, you know, CNC, you know, laser cutters, Mm -hmm. 3D printers, all of those kinds of things. Um, but one of the things I'd really like to see, because they're tools, they're tools just like all the other tools that, you know, cross people have used throughout the years. Um, Absolutely. And the evolution of those particular tools and the kind of really interesting critical work um, that might be uh, made and created using those particular tools. And, I mean, this has been happening. I mean, it's been happening organically for years, but also that the, the, multi, uh, the multiplicity of people's um, uh, practices and the interdisciplinary and the multidisciplinary, all of those kinds of things to create, as I said, sometimes sort of hybrid kinds of works, um, I find very exciting. And again, work of a critical and you know, caliber that is interesting and talking about issues that are important in the world. Um, so I guess that's kind of what I see as the next, the next thing I might be looking uh, forward to. Uh, I mean, it's not a great and huge uh, shift, again, because craftspeople have worked with tools for, for thousands upon thousands of years. Um, 
I think the one of the most interesting things that I did last year to see another perspective and to stand in a different place was Indigenous Fashion Week Toronto. Um, and that was about fashion, craft, and textiles um, with Indigenous voices, loud, proud, amazing. Um, so I think that's really important in, um, in, in, uh, with regard to the, you know, the TRC and um, that craft has a much larger history sometimes than um, maybe settler Canadians understand. And mm -hmm. that's an exciting um, new wave of, uh, of work and ideas to look forward to. Mm -hmm. I really feel like craft, because it has that innate human connection, there's something about being connected to the practices and the objects of craft that it can act as a language when conversations are difficult. And I think when voices need to be heard and deserve to be heard, they can be heard through that language of craft in a way that can change people's perspectives and change people's minds. And it is really important to make space for that direct voice to happen. Yeah, I agree. Brigitte, what do you think about the the evolution of craft training or or to respond to that comment? Well, uh, as Melanie said, there's a certain amount of very exciting work happening mm -hmm. in hybridization, is that the word? Where various craft media mix together and come out with this brand new kind of uh, uh, image and feel and message. And um, I'm looking at a piece right now here in my office by Yelda Borzoi. And it's a beautiful little uh, white porcelain cup, but the message is so uh, poignant that it could make you cry. And it's from the series of 50 Cups for 50 Lost Refugees, which is when her, her grandmother was um, um, killed in the war between Iran and Iraq. And so this is a beautiful object that's got this kind of major contradiction. You come to it and you want to touch it and it's sharp and it's beautiful. And the message inside is literally the name of the person when they wow. died and how they died of either starvation or, yeah, and, or, or worse from uh, migration periods of uh, history. So this is our time and this is our work that crafts makers and um, artists can do is not just it's it's not just about beauty in that sense or the function of the work i i, I call it the three h's <laughs> if you still have you still use your head and your heart and your hands and you make beautiful objects to me that can't stop no matter what the technologies with anybody brings in we're still making wonderful objects but i think with when you've got your your three h's connected together um, that's when the real material happens and the real message mm -hmm. comes through. Beautiful. I couldn't say it better. <laughs> it's, it's not the so I've got just a couple more questions, and I think we'll uh, we'll wrap after that. But um, just a generic question in response to all the things we've been talking about today: What advice would you give to someone who wants to take the next step in their craft career, whether it's opening the door to a new educational experience or applying for Harbor Front Center or another residency program? Or if it's someone who's just gotten into some of these programs, what is some of the opening advice or you think the strongest advice that you often give to people who are in those um, doorways to a new experience? Melanie, what are your thoughts? I think it's avail yourself of every resource that is offered to you. Um, whether that is a person, a book, a museum, a gallery, something online is that if you're going to embark try to get as uh, embark on this you know craft and design career to get as much information as possible um, in order to make it what i would call a considered sort of choice um, if you start with is it going to make me a a rich person or a really great living or you know um, that might not be the best way to go about it is I would say to people, interview, interview people like Brigitte Clavette, interview people like Amanda McCaver, <laughs> you know, or, you know, speak Klein or Habiba El Sayed or, 
you know, all of these amazing people who are actually doing and making and understand that there is over and above just this is what I do for a living. Um, this is what I am. This is why I make what I do. These are the choices that I made. So that there's an understanding that when you're, you're, you're going to make this choice to go to school, to choose the right school, to choose those professors who will help you realize sort of your objectives, what you want to achieve, but will also support the kind of life you choose to have, right? Um, no, you're not going to become a millionaire. Maybe the odd person will. Um, but there's different values that lead to a good and useful and enjoyable and fulfilling life. And I think craft and design mm, well is one of those fields, is one of those careers, um, whether it is that engagement with materials that you kind of make something from nothing. I think as a student, the first time that ever happened to me, it was like, wow, I did that. <laughs> um, so that kind of initial feeling to, you know, to sustain that um, and to talk, as I say, to those people that have been in the field for a very long time and just coming up and mid career, you know, um, just to be as, as, as informed as you possibly can be. That's the only advice I would have. Mm -hmm. And good advice it is. Brigitte? Mm -hmm. I'd say pay attention, uh, apply to everything, uh, learn and listen to others, as you say, Melanie, because I think uh, people are afraid to say, well, I'll never get that. Well, you'll never get it if you don't apply. Learn how to write a good grant application. Go to every information session given so that you learn and see who's there, see what questions they're asking. That's a, a junior person coming into the field. But at one point, even if you've been making for a number of years, or maybe it's time to check what are you making, who are you making for, who is your clientele, why are you making making it. And uh, perhaps it's time to replenish yourself. We go back to school, pick up uh, some more classes, a night class somewhere. It's the the, the collaboration in a way that happens or the, the, the mix in a classroom, you're, you do not know who you're going to be sitting next to, who's going to be sharing a bench with you in the jewelry studio and how that can change and empower your life. So I think in a sense, if you are always curious, always stay a little curious <laughs> and do not become too cocky because uh, <laughs> it's true because you've got to, you've got to have the curiosity and the humility to say, I'm going to try this. It may not work. And if it doesn't work, isn't that fantastic? Now you know. Now you know what not to do again. And I say that to my students all the time. Oh, look what happened. I melted my solder seam. Well, guess what? You're never going to do that again that way. And that's a good thing to know. So keep moving. And so to me, it's about curiosity, mm -hmm. I think. And a little bit of bravery, too. I think uh, my parents always said to me, um, oh, there's sure. a million reasons why you shouldn't do something or where, why you should stay home. But look to the reasons why you should do something or why you should take that path, because that will be the thing that tells you what you do and don't actually want to do. Mm -hmm. Well, I tell my students too, sometimes you may come out of here not making jewelry right away or setting up or I don't know, but you've learned so much. There's, you know, the, there's other trades there. You'll be making things for the rest of your life that are mm -hmm. attached to what you've learned here. So if you're a jewelry maker or somebody who works with your hands, you've learned how to solder and file and cut and poke and bend and you know, you know how to do all kinds of crazy stuff. And that is a transferable skill. So we've had people who've gone to work in the film industry to do small props and stuff. You know how to cast, you know how to make molds. When you do that and you start to recognize all the potential, that it doesn't have to stay in that lane. It, it takes you elsewhere. When I finished class on Friday last week, I ended up, I always do this at the end of each course, I uh, clear the table, clear the, the, the blackboard, and then I say, give me words. Give me words of everything you've learned this semester. And they just shout all this stuff at me, and I, I can't write fast enough. And I end up with a huge mind map, essentially. And then they go, wow. And that's that moment where it's like, God, I've done all that in four months, and that's what it's about. It's about making it concrete and just saying something simple as like, give me the words that 
are attached to all the new things that you've learned that you didn't know four months ago. And it's a pretty awakening. It's a it's a oh, I'm going to steal that, Brigitte. Really That's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> I usually take a photo. I didn't this time, but I do every semester, and it's really quite cramped. It's like, you know, anything to do with weights and measures and fire and, and temperatures and this and that and measurements and all kinds of things that they didn't think they were going to do in craft, but has to be there every day. Whether if you walk into any studio, you're using all these skills, mathematics and very powerful. logic and whatever. So I have one mm-hmm. big question for you. And it really um, ramps up from what we've been talking about, about, um, you know, being involved in the community, being involved in these different environments where you can learn from making those connections to other people in and outside of your existing circle and being brave enough to, to actually go out there and do that. And we've talked about that empowerment that craft can have and how can it change, how it can change your life and your direction. Um, but I do want to ask that bigger question that we get asked all the time. And that is, you know, what is the importance of craft in in, in the bigger picture, in culture, in society? Why does craft matter outside of our own craft field? We all love it. We all engage with it. We all believe in it. But what do we tell people when when we're asked that from the outside perspective? So I'm curious to know, because you, you bring in artists and you bring in students who are just learning about that, but I think that these experiences open up their eyes to that reality. So what what do you talk about when you talk about the importance of craft on society? And I know that's a big question, but it's a fun one to explore. So I'll, I'll hit it over to Melanie first. I'm actually going to uh, use somebody else's words. Um, and this is, uh, I'm going to read it because uh, I can't remember it off the top of my head. It's uh, by Edmund Duvall. He's a British uh, ceramist. And in 2015, Uh, He said uh, this about craft, quote, craft is the great otherness in our culture. It's little understood. It's extraordinarily relevant and powerful. It goes deep into people's lives. It's catalytic. It changes the world. It reaches deep into unknown histories that we are only beginning to understand. It crosses identities and genders and ethnicities in incredibly powerful ways. So it's a profound need of celebration and critical collaboration. And I would add to that, I think craft is something that, as you say, can start the conversation. It's a way in. Mm -hmm. Because for me, when I think about craft, I think about where it lives. It lives on my body. It lives in a home. It resides in galleries and museums, shops and sacred places. It could be a cup, a basket, Mm -hmm. a ring. It could be a weapon, a sculpture. It could be an installation. It's a way of thinking. Like Brigitte said, um, you can train as a jeweler but end up in the film industry. Um, It's this incredibly accessible way to talk about the world we live in, the values that we have, society at large. Mm-hmm. Yeah, true. Well said. I think too that I, the first word that came to my mind, and I don't know why it was, it was comfort, and comfort in the object. And I think that if I were to make that into like a little story, it would be like you know, the first thing you're given as a baby is some kind of blanket and uh, um, something that that you that you need. It's not only for nurturing purposes, but it's for protection and. Um, the object itself has function and comfort and also has a lot of challenge. Some of the good craft are very challenging and uncomfortable, Mm -hmm. like uh, Yelda's piece that I mentioned earlier. Um, Contemplation as well, I think, is uh, an important aspect of what craft does to me personally. I may look at it, I may need it for spiritual purposes or ritual purposes. I cannot see a life without these objects in my in my world or I think we all need it. I think we're not machines yet mm-hmm. and we're not being reproduced. <laughs> you know, this I think I just I, I don't know how to summarize it in a way because it's just uh, gut feelings about uh, purpose beauty to a certain extent for sure, comfort and challenge. Those are the words that come mm-hmm. up. I don't know. I like to think of it sense. as the 
the human tactile arts. I don't know if that makes a whole lot of sense either, but those are the words that I kind of am drawn to as well. Yeah. Well, I think that mm -hmm. is a beautiful way to end the conversation for today. I really loved having this conversation because you both brought such a thoughtful perspective about how all these pieces of a different craft career are intertwined and how at the end of the day, it all draws every piece of this, every step in this journey draws us into this human experience and a way that we can connect with each other and a way that we can speak to each other and share and be challenged and be comforted and all of those different things. So I want to thank you both for, for sharing your time and your thoughts and your energy on this. Um, I'm really going to leave this conversation feeling re-energized and um, um, ready to have some some deep thoughts about craft <laughs> so we don't do that all the time together yeah. right <laughs> but I'm grateful that we can share them with with all of our listeners here today so um, I'm gonna end today just by saying is there is there anything else that you want to share with the community I feel like we've we've really given it our all today but is there anything else that you want to share for me, I just want to say, you know, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And it's so lovely to be on this podcast with Brigitte, again, somebody I've always, always respected. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. And think that what she's doing is so important and so relevant in the world. Um, and yes, it, I really appreciated this, uh, this chance to say a few words. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the same with me. And <laughs> I think it's the same with me, but it's very interesting because I feel like I'm in the small, small region. I'm in Fredericton. I'm far away and it's a small city. And for me, because you live in Toronto and the importance of your role in the craft community with your wonderful work at Harbourfront, that seems so large. But, you know, we're all in the same. We're all interwoven together in all this aspect so um intimidating sometimes <laughs> but i've really enjoyed my conversation as well with all of you if you are curious to know how you can connect to an educational program or a residency opportunity turn to your local provincial or territorial craft council to learn about the options in your own backyard across the country and across the globe by sharing information these councils open doors to help you take your next steps I'd like to thank everyone at the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design who helped to make today's podcast possible. NBCCD is an intimate school with a really fantastic array of instructors and programs that make the learning environment effective and honestly, really fun. I've had the pleasure of visiting the school many times as a lecturer, as an instructor, as a student myself in some of their adventures courses, and I've even picked up some student work for my own personal collection as well. It's a place where talented artists go and where talented artists grow. Find out more for yourself by visiting nbccd.ca today. Learn more about this movement at citizensofcraft.ca. There you can see the profiles of over 600 professional craft artists in Canada. You can search by artist, medium, and location, even your own postal code, to connect with artists where they live and work across the country. If you're a maker or a lover of all things craft, make a local connection. Look up your local provincial or territorial craft council to learn more about craft in your region. Join us next time on the Citizens of Craft podcast. And until then, craft on. <laughs>